Silent scan. Silent scan. Bombs and bits. You can't control us. Bombs and bits. A frightening dystopia. Bombs and bits. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Open your eyes. Bombs and bits. An alternate reality. <laughs> we begin as wanderers, and we are wanderers still. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Bombs and Bands with John, Mark, and the Missus. I'm John, and with me, as always, is Mark. Howdy. And the Missus. We'll cover... <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> you did it again! again. <laughs> Continually. <laughs> You're such an ass. <laughs> and the Missus. Well, now I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to get a little bell, and every time it's my turn to talk, I'm just going to ring my little bell. <laughs> Like Tinkerbell. Oh, God, now we're going to get sued. <laughs> we'll, oh, no, not Disney. <laughs> <laughs> the mouse lawyers are the worst. Okay. Oh, Di- Disney. We know how Disney is. They hire private detectives to go around and find people that are violating their copyrights. I was wondering what the big boom mic over on my computer here was. Now I know. <laughs> <laughs> and now we will be forced to apologize to China. Okay. Yeah. I'm not even joking though on that. Okay, I'll let you know that. I know. I know. My I... brother, my brother was friends with a guy that that was his job. Well, it's, at least it's not Ron. H- oh, I don't want to mention the ology people. Anyway, next. You know, I didn't even make it through the intro piece. I know. Okay. Will cover. Really, really. Clicking your clicking your beverage open. <laughs> And laughing, why that? That's payback, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> and the missus. We'll cover three stories on this week's episode. Up first, I'll tackle science replication. And no, this has nothing to do with Sean Young. Then Mark will handle what's the difference between scavenging and looting. And finally, wrapping things up will be the missus, who will be talking about the American Conservative article, A Cautionary Tale of the Finnish Civil War. But we have something amazing coming. Tonight's sponsor is Sham Cow. It's a chemical-based butter substitute. We're not legally allowed to call it food, but, you know, it... You, you can put it in your pie hole and chew it up and swallow it. Well, no, we can't say that either. It's like gum. You can chew it up. <laughs> oh, my but... God. It lasts for seven years in your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it lubricates your elbows. <laughs> Just as well eat the best. I've been, I've been <laughs> chewing gum wrong this whole time. Just as well eat the best. <laughs> and we'll have our very first commercial for the Joe Biden Dance Party album. I'm ready for this. Got my Don't forget to bring your party. scented wigs for him to uh, scent, smell. And your barrettes. <laughs> See, that's the basis yeah. for the techno beat. It's the... If you keep doing that, you're just going to pass out. Oh, no. I have many blood cells. Oh, okay. And in the part, uh, I guess it's time to actually get to the stories, isn't it? A more prepared show host might write that down. Well, normally I do, <laughs> but a friend came in from out of town. My suit was lost for cleaners. But I, I will say this. And here, here's something I, I, I uh, want to say in a heartfelt sense to our listeners or a listener who I believe is in Indiana. Thank you very much for coming in and, and listening to us. We missed you as much as you missed us, which I hope you missed us a little at least. So uh, <laughs> jumping back into that, uh, my story is actually from sciencealert.com. It's about non-replicable studies make the most impact scientists find. Well, us talk about replication. And this is not about creating androids that look like Sean Young or Rutger Hauer that have the best lines in a movie. How about sheep with uh, sheep androids with Sean Young's face? Hmm. Am I the only one that has that dream? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right. Yes, I'm sure that's the case. <laughs> but we all dream about sheep with Rutger Hauer's face, right? <laughs> uh, uh, well, I can't speak. Well, I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> no, this is actually about replicating science experiments, not sheep with Rutger Hauer's face or Sean Young with sheep's. I'm... How was that dream? Not bad. <laughs> I'm just concerned about you at this point. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, uh, mm. 
I have rendered you speechless. My job here is done. Yes, uh, I need to, uh, Let me uh, drop the mic and walk out. Brain bleach. Okay. <laughs> so, forging ahead. My college chemistry lab professor used to say that everyone should be able to take the same starting conditions, do an experiment, and get the same results. It's called replication, and it doesn't involve Sean Young. It's like when the dogs did the experiment on Pavlov, where the drooling dogs taught Pavlov to give them food and write in a notebook. The and dogs it, wrote it down in the notebook? That's no, pretty amazing. Pavlov I had to the oh, okay. Because, see, the, when the dogs start drooling, they taught Pavlov to give them food and then write it in a notebook. And if we and have, when Pavlov started drooling, it's because he was thinking about Sean Young as a sheep. Well, <laughs> that experiment or not. <laughs> The left likes to make fun of the right to say that the rights don't like science based on, well, I'm, I'm not sure of what. Religion? Why, why did the left just say that people on the right don't like science? Because they want to feel superior. It turns out the whole doing experiments and verifying the original results thing as being a part of science that the left is like, it's not a thing. Well, because they only really like it when it suits their purposes, right? Oh, it, oh we're getting to that. In some studies, only 36% of findings can be replicated. So of all of science, it looks like only 36% of those findings can be replicated, which comes, I mean, that, that shows the incredible number of bogus studies we see on a regular basis. Well, it's not that they're bogus, and I'll step up and defend that. It's not that they're bogus. It's just that you can't reproduce them. And if you can't reproduce them, then they aren't good science, because that's part of the scientific the whole scientific exactly. method thing, right? Yeah. And if you can't reproduce it, it's bogus. I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to stick with that. I think that's a harsh word. Again, I don't think it makes it bogus. It was just maybe a one-time fluke. I think it depends on the study. I mean, there are some studies out there that are clear that the conclusions that were drawn from the research are bogus, like the Stanford prison experiment. Yeah. Um, or... The one, I can't remember the name of the study now, it was in the 60s, I think, where they had people shocking other people. The Milgram experiment. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember on that one they the, that the notes had finally been released. You know, their whole explanation for why the people were willing to shock the others was completely wrong because what the notes indicated was these people thought it was necessary in order to save lives because this research was so important. And, you know, they made it more like they were just sadistic. We were only following orders, one might say. No, and I think that's exactly right because they tried to they tried to, to sell it as just that. But as bad as the science replication is, it gets worse because the craziest stories, the worst stories, they get replicated. And it's like lesbian weightlifters more likely to eat Doritos is cited much more often than people like pepperoni on their pizza. The more outlandish the result, the more likely it is to be cited by other people. This very much reminded me of. Uh... Those three re researchers who wrote a bunch of papers that were completely bogus and completely fake and then set along to see if they could get them published. And all of them but six were either accepted or were in the process of being accepted when they came out and revealed what they had done. I think the problem is actually sort of illustrated in this article. One of the parts is, you know, they sort of have the question is, why are these non-replicable papers accepted for publication in the first place? And the researchers said, well, a possible answer is the review team faces a trade-off when the results are more interesting they apply lower standards regarding their reproducibility. And, you know, that's just a brown nosing way of saying, uh, you know, or, or, or they're just trying to be disingenuous because what it really is, these papers are published and they're copied, you know, and referred to and cited more often than others because they represent something that the, the, these researchers or these editors or peer reviewers want to hear. It affirms their viewpoint. So, you know, if you have a paper that says religious people are, well, people, people that watch Fox News, for instance, are going to be more educated on the facts about a certain subject. Or you have a paper that says that people watch Fox News are all knuckle dragging Neanderthals with IQs of 50. You know, these researchers are going to just gravitate to the to the one that insults the people they don't like because that's what they want to hear. And, you know, when you look at some of these, that's I think that's why it, what, it would, what it is. The Stanford prison experiment satisfied what they felt the world was really like as opposed to necessarily what it really was like. Well, especially in the 60s when it was carried out. These studies with these exciting things are, guess how many more times shown than just a regular boring paper? 153 times. Non-replicable studies are shown 153 more times. Well, because they're interesting. They're, <clears throat> they're academic clickbait. Yes, it's a really good way to say it. And speaking of academic clickbait, 
There is one thing I learned during my uh, research on this. Hmm. Cruella DeVille is actually a scientist. And when she wants to do research, you know what she wears? A lab coat. So one of the things that really bothered me about this article as I was going through this, for one thing, all of this really seems like it's one big appeal to authority. And where we heard that over and over again repeatedly for the past year. And then again, this article does something very similar because they conflate that 1998 paper that linked autism to vaccines with the reason why people are reluctant to take the COVID vaccine. And it seems to me, from my point of view, that those two things have nothing to do with each other. People aren't not taking the COVID vaccine because they're worried about autism, though it might be something similar. I mean, we've talked about this before, and you may have seen this, those of you listening and watching this right now. Uh, I know I've seen it on TV late at night, the uh, the ambulance chasing lawyers and their car, their commercial. And this is a legitimate one that I've Absolutely. seen. Has, did your son take this such and such ADHD dr- drug? Did he grow boobies? If so, you're entitled to compensation. So that drug went completely through FDA testing, which this COVID vaccine has not done. And they missed that side effect. How do they miss something that big? And did they miss something with this? And I think that people who are what they would call vaccine hesitant might be following that line of thought. This is the first vaccine in human history where the mice get it after the human trials are done. Because they've only done about halfway through the human trials, right? Absolutely. Yeah. They'll probably get yanked off of YouTube for this. After the big giant mouse comes over and pounds the crap out of us. <laughs> well, let's see. What but else? The, we... But he'll do it with a big squeaky hammer. <laughs> Who else have we irritated tonight? China and Scientology. Yep. We, we got the trifecta going. <laughs> I think that's a quadfecta. <laughs> but the good thing, though, is if, if that happens, at least we won't have to worry about taking our own garbage out anymore. <laughs> On that note, let's move to one of the best chemical-based substitutes for butter ever produced. You can spread it on your butter. You can spread it on your own buns. (laughs) Okay, that one I might take out. (laughs) It came out much dirtier than I needed to sound. (laughs) Well, we're a rowdy bunch tonight, aren't we? What we're talking about, of course, is sham cow. What did you do for Earth Day, Susan? For Earth Day, I recycled my old bras into decorative hanging planters and braided the elastic from my old underwear to make a bungee cord for the kids so they could jump off a bridge. I'll miss little Timmy. What did you do, Tom? Well, I just ate buttered bread. Buttered bread? How does that help the environment? While it really was bread, I can't legally call it butter. Heck, I can't even legally call it food. It wasn't butter. It was sham cow. What is sham cow? And why is it good for the environment? Sham cow is made from 100% industrial waste. Post-consumer industrial waste, so you know it's good stuff. Industrial waste? But isn't that dangerous? Of course not. One person's trash is another person's treasure. And sham cow is pure gold. At least the sham cow made from silicon chip cleaning solvent waste. But won't it make me fat? No way! Sham cow doesn't contain any usable nutrition for any living organism yet known to man. But does it taste good? Well, after you get used to the metal shavings and occasional blasts of high strength acid, there's nothing better to spread on bread. In fact, sometimes there's enough chemical activity that sham cow turns your bread into toast from the exothermic reactions. Wow, eating industrial waste that won't go to my waste? Sounds too good to be true. It's It's not food, food. it's It's sham sham cow. cow. Sham cow. Slop cop product is not licensed in Iowa, either of the Dakotas, or Finland. Well, that certainly means that I'll be buying some sham cow. It sounds like it would be great at both degreasing parts as well as being a tasty non nutritive You can butter both ends well, it, of your bread. We can't call it food. We can't call it butter. Right, anyway. Uh, but up next it's is it's a food supplement. Can't call it that either because that FDA is tough about this stuff. But supplements don't require FDA approval. Not non nutritive food supplement. You could talk about a uranium tailings. Oh wait, it's in. That's why I can eat eighteen thousand grams of maca root a day. Uranium tailings is in sham cow. I just read the. Oh, yeah, yeah. Does right. my skin look young? No. Okay. <laughs> so moving along, a <laughs> mark is up next with a story from survivaljack.com, and it's called looting versus scavenging which is something we often talk about on friday nights after someone brought home a doggy bag and it has steak in it 
Mark, take us away. All right. Well, looting versus scavenging. The author here describes looting as the act of stealing or the taking of goods by force that are clearly owned by another, often associated with rioting. And he defines scavenging as the act of taking or gathering something usable from discarded material or clearly abandoned property. In some ways, this is sort of a daydream uh, prepping <laughs> type of thing. This is this is for like, you know, total end of the world, cats and dogs falling from the sky and, you know, volcanoes erupting everywhere. And that's one of the places where this sort of definition comes out is one man's looting is another man's scavenging. Because one of the things I've noted, is that there are many, many people that I see in the survival community who talk about this cabin that they have over 700 miles from where they live, and it's filled with all their stuff. And so if anybody breaks in, that's technically looting. But let's face it, they're never going to make 700 miles after something really bad happens, as in the Schumer hits the fan. Well, remember, you can scavenge what isn't nailed down, and what isn't nailed down can be pried loose. So so one of the places I get to is people, if they show up and be going, I was looted, and the other people who just took the stuff would go, hey, we did a great job scavenging. Yeah, he gives some ideas here so you can sort of get an idea of what are you doing. So some questions to ask yourself, what are you taking? Basically, it comes down to, are you going after necessities or is that big screen TV the <laughs> your uh, main yeah. object? You know, why are you taking it? Is it a necessity or is it a luxury or, or something? Well, if you're uh, a woman from New York, you know, it's just reparation. <laughs> That's right. And if it's if it's in California, I mean, it, it's I, I think there it's it's looting only if it's over two thousand dollars. That's actually. Yes, absolutely. Correct. <laughs> he suggests that if you're you're going to an electronics store, jewelry store, liquor store, he even mentions clothing, you're looting. He goes on to discuss, you know, some of the places to scavenge and where to scavenge. Some of the places he suggests for scavenging are abandoned farms, a supply line type materials, you know, like trains and or ships, semi trucks that might be abandoned or whatever, or their trailers, distribution centers, warehouses, marketplaces, abandoned stores, processing factories, abandoned cars, rubbish gathering areas, abandoned homes, etc. One of the things around here, living in the farm belt as we do, the sticks, the sticks grain silos they're owned by corporations in new york and if things really went bad i mean my, my level of personal angst at opening up a grain silo to feed people corn you know if there was a famine going on would be probably around zero it's going to be very situational because you know obviously you could go to two stores one store's got somebody feisty there who wants to protect it against all costs if you're going to try to get into there that's looting but maybe the store across the street is you know, some chain store, it's abandoned. I'm going to throw out something that's, that's going to sound pretty provocative, but let's think about this. In the year that we're living in, 2021, the things that we used to take for granted about our justice system appear to be gone. And this we're is deeply declining. Well, yeah. Derek Chauvin's going to prison for being a cop doing something that he was taught to do. And I just read about a man who shot another man. It was like nine times with the nine millimeter, shot a 70 year old man and got off and was acquitted by the jury. So one of the things this argument is based on and it's predicated on is the rule of law. Are we even there anymore? Does the law even matter in many of these places? Well, does it even apply? I mean, if we're not going to apply the law equally, right? That's kind of one of the foundations of Western thought and Western civilization is that the law applies equally to everyone. It applies to a king and a commoner the same. Yeah, but we're not we're not seeing that now. I mean, you talk about your case, the cases there. Well, I mean, Derek Chauvin was a, a white man killing a black man. Uh, whereas, I, if I remember correctly, I think from that other story, wasn't that a, a black offender that killed a white elderly man? Uh, that that indeed is correct. You know, we see the same thing. Uh, you know, in other other aspects. You know, for instance, the the riots in uh, Milwaukee or in New York. I mean, in New York, they were going through and looting these very high end jewelry and and clothing stores and and so forth. And that was perfectly acceptable because that's that's out in the street. But you know, the people going into the Congress that made you know our rulers a little un, uneasy. So you know, that is an insurrection. Of course. And 
And we see it in lots of other cases. You know, you can have a, a mob uh, of Black Lives Matter protesters or, or Antifa point guns and other weapons and throw bricks and everything like that at, at, at a person who's not part of the protest. And that will not be punished. But if the person that is having guns pointed at him or having rocks and, and bricks thrown at him responds in any way, then he will be arrested and prosecuted. And we've seen that in Portland. And especially I, I can think of at least two cases off the top of my head from Portland. And we've seen it up in Washington. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure I could go in, do a Google search and find a bunch more. Maybe the worst one is Kyle Rittenhouse's situation. He is yet to uh, face his trial. But again, I think this article makes a presupposition that no longer exists. It supposes that the rule of law matters. And I think we're seeing on a regular basis that the rule of law is not what we've seen for the last 100 years. You know, I remember being a kid and learning about King Arthur and reading about King Arthur. One of the things about the Arthurian legend, right, is that it took knighthood and took it from being might makes right to might for right. And it seems like we're going back to that former definition. Absolutely, that's the case. And, and, that, and that's the, the beautiful part of Western civilization is it was a case of the right matter. It mattered more. Well, Time for Joe Biden's dance party. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, I guess war crimes are back on the table, aren't they? Well, <laughs> well, that just turned darker than I was expecting. So let's go to Joe Biden's dance party. Take us away, Joe. Do you love to party? Can you cut a rug with the best of them? Are you a Democrat who voted for a corrupt, senile old man for president? Then you're going to love Joe Biden Dance Party. This two-album collection features many of our 46 president's favorite dance tracks, some of which he even remembers. Check out such great tracks as Come On, Man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Can I sniff your hair, little girl? Corn Pop was a bad dude. Corn Pop was a bad dude. And he ran a bunch of bad boys. And the immortal, don't forget the big guy's cut. Crack cocaine. Yeah. I, uh. That's right. It's all of the best dance tracks in Joe Biden's library, specially selected for you and all of your dead relatives who voted for it. And who, besides Joe that is, can forget songs like China On My Mind. Xi Jinping. I know him well. Xi Jinping. Forever Your Man in the White House. Can I go to? And one, two, three masks for me. D -d -d Double masking. You put another layer on, it just makes common sense. D -d -d Double masking. All this can be yours for the low price of $19.95. But wait, there's more. Customers who order in the next 30 minutes will receive a free Hunter Biden signature laptop. Guaranteed to hide all traces of your felonious nepotism. I spent more time on my hands and knees. Call now, 1-800-SLEEPY-JOE. That's 1-800-SLEEPY-JOE. Call now and get yours today. Allow two to three years for delivery. But Kamala will be president by then, but it won't matter anyway. You know, this reminds me, uh, the, the Joe Biden dance party reminds me of an episode of Hee Haw. I'll bite. I'm a sniffing and I'm incontinent. See, that's humor. That's how it's made, folks. Our final story of the evening. It's like sausage. You don't want to get too close to what's right. happening, though. Or, or Joe Biden. Yes. <laughs> we have from the American Conservative, a cautionary tale of the Finnish Civil War and the missus. Take it away. Indeed, I shall. That sounded overly dramatic, especially after the dance party. No, if I was trying to be overly dramatic, I would have done it in an English accent. Indeed, I shall. That's Scottish. It was a little bit, yeah. And Sometimes it comes. No one down takes that the Scots seriously. The <laughs> English don't take the Scots seriously. No one takes the Scots seriously. <laughs> and you have, just like Sean Connery, after he his book after his bookcase collapsed on him, only my shelf to blame. <laughs> You've just been waiting for that Sean Connery joke. But you know what Sean Connery wasn't. Finnish. Even uh, he, if he had been in a movie about the Finnish Civil War, he mm -hmm. would have had a Scottish accent. Mm -hmm. All right, so Finnish Civil War. Now you might be saying to yourself, Finnish Civil War? They had a civil war in Finland? The hell you say? When did that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked. It happened in 1918. 
And the reason most people really have never heard of it uh, is because there were a few other things going on in 1918 at that time. I'm not sure if you were aware. It kind of pushed it out of the headlines. And another thing, it only lasted for, th for three months. So here's a brief recap of what happened. Essentially, there were two factions. One was known as the Reds. The other were the, or the Whites. The Reds were, surprise, surprise, the Communists. And the Whites were, well, everyone else who wasn't a communist. So by early 1917, the Reds had taken over the judicial system. And they had disbanded the police. They uh, had left only leftist militias. And they were the only law enforcement body they had. Is this kind of sounding shockingly Oh, familiar? I've got some quotes here, too. Okay. Yeah. And the Reds term for anyone who was not a Red, they would use pejorative terms for them. They just generally referred to them all as butchers. So even Lenin thought these guys were kind of a bunch of idiots, though he'd been pushing other communists around the world to rise up and foment this communist takeover of the world so we could all live in the communist utopia that was the former Soviet Union. But anyway, he thought these guys were kind of a bunch of knuckleheads, and he essentially was pretty right. In January of 1918, war broke out. For real. That's when it started. They were actually hot, hot war shooting at each other. Final casualty count for the war, about 37,000 dead, 27,000 of whom were the Reds. Good. Yes. And about 5,000 were the Whites. Uh, this is an excellent article. I, I commend anyone to go and read this. People on the right, or uh, I'm just going to call it the non-left, because it wasn't the right. There's people on the non-left. Well, like I said, the whites were yes. everyone else who yeah. weren't communists. In the countryside, this is a direct quote, in the countryside, the farmers began to organize mostly unarmed fire brigades that were not formal militias since they lacked arms and government help, but were meant to form the kernel of such forces if needed. But what did the Reds do when they got power? They did what the Reds always do when they get power. The Reds immediately unleashed a red terror in the areas they controlled. Comparatively, because the Finns don't like to be within 20 feet of each other, except for during mating season, uh, you know, it, was, it was restrained. Except in Helsinki, we saw a much more traditional left terror, both random and targeted killings. With the re revolutionary quotes mostly handed out fines and imprisonment not execution. They focused not on class membership, but on specific proven actions deemed to be harmful for the, for the working class. Again, the Finns do everything pretty darn well, like even horrible communist revolutions. But the Finns themselves stopped the Reds. And that's, and that's one of the beautiful parts of this particular story. Right. And actually what happened to most of the Reds there at the end of the war, which again, only lasted for about three months, is that their morale just collapsed because they were so haphazardly organized and just a bunch of complete idiots. And they right? were being slaughtered by the whites. Right, right. And they ran, and they ran to Russia, which was by that time mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. And, and you know, as far as sort of stories go, that's a great finish. Uh, finish. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to comment real quick. I've got this, actually, it's a, it's a quote on this one, but uh, so the commies had been all prepping for the election they're talking about in the article. And I like this part uh, about this election. Shockingly to them, amidst large turnout, the SDP, which was the commies, lost the parliamentary election. The surprised SDP immediately started threatening violent revolution and issued a long list of non-negotiable demands, including confiscation of any non-left weapons. Always the core demand of leftists as soon as they have any power. I love that. It's so true. Well, the essence of <laughs> well, the essence of the right is actual cooperation. You know, if you have two people with pistols and they don't agree, well, things happen. But if only one side has a pistol, then whatever the guy with the pistol wants happens. And that's true, and it's been true throughout our entire civilization. How does that song by the refreshments go? Mm -hmm. Well, I've got the pistol, so I'll take the pesos. That seems fair. Exactly. Um, you know, all men were created uh, created equal, Sam Gold. I'm butchering this. Quote you right really now. are, yeah. <laughs> I'll put the right one up. Mark? It's good. God, God created men. Uh, Sam Colt made them equal. There you go. <laughs> Mark saving my bacon yet again. <laughs> so this show is now officially non halal. Well, the thing I like best about you were talking about right there, Mark, about the Reds not winning the election is because I think that they, as I remember, they had done something to try and, um, oh, I don't know, cheat, right? Because they thought they were going to win. They had tried to set up the rules so that it completely was in their favor. And it totally backfired on them, which is really what pissed them off, I think. Yeah, it, it says in here that, that uh, so when, when the parliament was dissolved, a new uh, 
elections were scheduled that the uh, SDP was not happy, but assumed that they would win. But then it goes on. Violence by the left increased rapidly, including more riots in the major cities. In response, the non-left elements of society finally started forming armed private security forces in the cities. Well, and it kind of worries me that we're kind of on that track right now. I mean, when you look at what's gone on, and it's still going on in, in Portland, I know, certainly. You think? Yeah. You think? <laughs> Of course we are. The Constitution and the rule of law ceased to exist about nine months ago. Yeah, about this time last year, about a year ago. Yeah. Well, and this was the bottom line from the author on this article. He said, first and foremost, the left will never stop voluntarily. They will seize power by any means, including through cheating, through deception, and through violence. And finally, this, that they can be stopped. They can be stopped but not with words. What are you pointing at? You know he can't see you, right? Uh, 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 <laughs> I was pointing at you so that you know to wait for Mark so that Mark can say something oh, okay. pithy and intelligent. So oh, okay. okay. Well, to borrow from the uh, uh, Antifa and BLM's favorite author, the uh, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. if we haven't said enough to get us kicked off of YouTube in this podcast. I don't know what it's going to take, guys. Hey, hey, that was a pro-China quote. Rumble, right. here we come. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, well, I'm not going to do a Chinese voice now. <laughs> well, on that note, we'll be back next week with another edition of Bombs and Bants. And thank you for listening. I'm John. I'm Mark. And I'm your missus. Take care. Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>